How's All everybody right. doing? All right. Hopefully you're not too tired. You're still with us. See a lot of good sessions about how to build brand new, shiny, awesome apps using some of the latest frameworks. Really exciting things, right? Hey, but those old apps are pretty cool too. I'm telling you. Don't, don't abandon those legacy <laughs> apps. They still need love. That's right. Speaking of which, that's why we're here, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> So we're, uh, we're going to cover enterprise application migration, uh, a story of a project, an effort at the Home Depot. Yes. Ashley's going to take us through uh, the technical aspects of what was done and why. So without How any, not to royally mess it up, and too. And how not to mess it up. That's an important one. Right. <laughs> so you want to go through? Uh, yeah, so just a little bit of high level over here. Um, we're going to go over what is legacy. I think that it's a little different for everybody here in the room, but we're going to try and get some common ground with us all so that we can communicate. Uh, background of what grid app or grid platform at Home Depot is. Uh, it's actually this nice homegrown platform we built years ago. And we'll talk a little more. And then the, the technical t challenges that we met along the way of what it looked like to uh, modernize some of these legacy applications on this old platform. Uh, and then, of course, we want to give you some feedback on what not to do, um, some things that we took away from our process that maybe, maybe you can apply to your process wherever you may be. And of course, any little tech tips that we learned. Uh, I think we've got some really nice, surprising things that you may not have seen in a Pivotal platform before. Cool. So as part of intros, my name is Mike Wright. I'm a platform architect manager based in Atlanta. Spend a lot of time with the Home Depot team uh, locally in Atlanta. And I'm Ashley Eckert, a senior systems engineer on the application platforms team at Home Depot. I actually originally started as a developer years ago at a startup company. Uh, but as I came into Home Depot, I found myself very close to a systems team and kind of grew into them. Uh, which brings me here today, and of course, I really like chocolate, y'all, so um, your feedback in chocolate would be really appreciated. <laughs> Who doesn't like chocolate? <laughs> so, as we dig in here, you know, I'm, sh I'm sure everybody came to this session because you probably represent, in some way, a legacy application within an enterprise. Um, and let's talk about, you know, what does legacy mean? And, and actually, as a matter of uh, just a quick survey, who in the room is responsible or in some way uh, developing or maintaining or caring for the future or not the future of a legacy application. Anybody else in the room? Oh wow, plenty of you. Not okay, surprising. great. Yeah, yeah, and you know, to that point, uh, you know, legacy applications could mean quite a variety of things to you folks in the audience. And you know, we're going to go through the Home Depot scenario, obviously here. But you know, everybody's got the fire-breathing monolith of some sort. Uh, you may have a legacy that looks like JE applications running on WebLogic and WebSphere, JBoss even. That's kind of my heritage where I came from. Or you might have .NET, full stack .NET, IIS, you know, embedded into the operating system. And uh, you know, there's all kinds of complexities about how do I take that application and make it cloud native. Or you might even have just plain old Java server apps that are running on an old version of JDK. You know, your CISO is hounding you because you're, you're way out of compliance with, you know, patching and things like that. And the hardware itself is probably end of life and it's time to move on with that as well. Maybe it's virtualized, maybe it's not. So legacy applications can look like all kinds of different things. And we're going to hopefully kind of bring some points forward with the project, the effort that Ashley worked on. Sure. And leave you with some tips. So what is legacy and the grid at Home Depot. Absolutely. Uh, so legacy at Home Depot before grid actually was a JE environment that ran on IBM servers. Um, quite a bit of heavy support model with IBM, quite a bit of money, obviously. Uh, and we quickly found that our developers predating Docker, predating 12-factor methods, were looking for an out to deploy quickly and get their jobs done. Uh, so Home Depot quickly turned to the open source community where they found Apache Tomcat, uh, Eclipse, uh, Nest Scalers, which we were very familiar with at Home Depot, and we built our own grid platform. And what this did for our developers is gave them that out to deploy and get their jobs done to production quickly. 
This is a really great model, and it was a lot of fun, yeah. but... Uh, <laughs> well, physical servers, right? I guess one of the great things about it was, um, you know, at the time, you know, they have all these clustering technologies from IBM yeah. and Oracle and you name it. Uh, the simplicity of this legacy stack was it ran on bare metal. It really did. And it if, was actually very cost effective for the time. Right. And if a, if a server failed, you just basically pull it out. There's and another. Put another one in. So, so, so all legacy applications, you know, have good designs for their time. But obviously technologies change. Yes. And now new, new motivations as to what to do with those applications arise. Cool. So why migrate now? Well, I think the obvious answer is cost, first and mm -hmm. foremost. But again, we started recognizing that our developers were once again looking for an out. What was motivating them? Where were they going? So once again, we turned to the open source community where we found that a lot of developers were going towards a cloud environment. Uh, that's actually when we started conversations with Pivotal. And it came, became obvious that Pivotal provided our developers many new technologies that they could now implement where appropriate to our enterprise. So I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and on that platform journey comment, there's a funny analogy that we're going to go through here <laughs> real quick. So bear with me, dad humor. OK, let me uh, get a drink. So, <laughs> so the platform at Home Depot, that started what? four mm. or five years ago? That was uh, 2015? 2015. 2015. Okay. Well, at that time, um, the platform was really typecasted. Um, yes. And you know, uh, just like Mark Hamill, could never shake this idea of Luke Skywalker. No matter what, what movie he showed up in, like Corvette Summer, everybody watched that movie and say, there's Luke Skywalker in a, mo in a movie. No, he can play other roles. You know, he's in this, sh this, this movie here called Corvette Summer. Uh, so anyway, you know, Cloud Foundry kind of um, was impacted by that typecasting you yeah. know, early on. And that's, you know, to, to our own fault coming out saying it's the best place for Greenfield and 12-factor applications. Uh, anything else, you might want to look at some, some other platform. So how did, how did we shake that? Um, Probably some of the other characteristics about the platform you don't realize today uh, is that the platform really is versatile. And, and that's what we're going to kind of explain through yep. you know, the demonstration of what you, uh, of the approach you took at Home Depot. But things like running Docker images or uh, the, the, the ones that I like, uh, that I think are most interesting and even more rarely used is taking the Ubuntu binaries of some client, uh, client application, packaging it up and pushing it with binary build pack and running that as a batch application called Task in Cloud Foundry. Wait, I didn't know this, and I'm a systems engineer. <laughs> we, keep, we keep holding back our surprises. OK, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, if you've got the platform, if you're running Cloud Foundry, or if you've got this preconceived notion about what the platform does, uh, just know that it's much more than just 12-factor greenfield applications that can run in this platform. And hopefully, you'll see that in this example. So, um, just like any other client or any, any other enterprise, there's decisions that need to be made. You know, like the one in this case with the grid application, you know, we have to look at the business factors. What do we do with these, these legacy applications? Are they generating revenue? Are our store associates depending on these applications? Um, do they have a, a feature set, a backlog of feature sets for the future? Uh, are there developers still working on these applications? You know, it's all kinds of criteria that you look at from a business perspective, and then make decisions about how much effort does it make sense to really put into these applications and move them into you know, a cloud-based environment. So in this case, we're, we're talking about a scenario where we went through replatforming. Absolutely. Right? So we didn't rebuild, uh, and uh, we didn't, didn't want to put a whole lot of effort into the, the project. So how did you approach the problem? Let's uh, dig in. OK, so we really approach the problem uh, looking at the technical differences between our platforms. We Here on one side, we have a grid platform, which is a Apache Tomcat um, simple, small environment. And we have our Pivotal platform, which is pretty versatile. Uh, and we first looked at a networking layer, which was pretty big. but. Um, when we first started, 
Go to the next slide for me. <laughs> Um, well, before before are we are you sure? <laughs> yeah. Are you ready to ask the hard questions? No, I'll we'll, we'll jump to that. Are slide. you okay. sure? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's go ahead and show you. So this is actually an example of what we have today. In your top left, you have our grid platform, and your bottom um, center is our PCF or Pivotal platform uh, example, and how we're interconnecting the network layer. The problem we had when we started off looking at the network piece was our grid platform requires SSL communication between our apps. That's how we identify where apps belong, is using an SSL import. But for our Pivotal platform here, uh, that's not a requirement. In fact, we terminate SSL at the load balancer before we even come into our, our platform in Pivotal. So how we actually looked into solving this was first with Envoy. And Envoy also gave us an additional feature of being able to um, dial in our traffic and bleed it over into Pivotal so that we can keep running apps live while we made this transformation. Huge feat, right? Yeah. But we actually decided not to use Envoy, sorry. <laughs> um, and that was truly because it was a cost-effective problem. Um, the amount of research and the amount of implementation it would have taken for us to get Envoy set up to do this the way we needed um, just wasn't in the books for us at the moment. So we ended up using something called Traffic or Trafic. Yeah. Whichever right. you prefer. <laughs> I, I do believe the, tra the correct uh, one is traffic. Traffic. But yeah. I will probably say traffic too. <laughs> so traffic actually gave us a way, so um, it gave us an opportunity to listen for that SSL port for that app such that when Grid was getting traffic, um, and yes, I did make a code change. I know you wanted to ask so bad. I wanted to ask the question. <sighs> okay, I made a code, a code change. change. It was on a system side end, okay? It, it wasn't an actual app, it was, it was the system. Um, but we did make a small change to our grid management tool, which is um, like Pivotal Platform. It's an IP table that says, how do I look up an app and know where it lives? So we made a modification to say, well, I'm also listening for apps that are now on Pivotal Platform. And if I see one come in, I'm going to redirect and take you to the, its load balancers. And once it gets to PCF platform, it's all 80 traffic. And it comes in. Uh, and how we have the, uh, the grid app wrapped, and we'll get to that, um, it still needs to know which SSL port it's listening for. Because we, remember, we don't want to make any changes to the app's actual code. We want to make this a seamless experience for our developers so when they deploy, they're like, oh, I haven't looked at this code in like five years. Why? I don't remember a thing, right? So let's make this easy. So you, had, you handled the DNS in a way that the developers can self-service make the decision about cutting traffic over from the old grid. Absolutely. To apps running in the platform. It will right? be a light switch. It'll and be a light switch. They can switch. turn it on, test a little. If it works, turn it back off. If it doesn't, and make their choice. And that's, that's a common challenge in uh, monolithic application migrations. Sometimes you want to take pieces of those systems yes. over gradually. So you need a way to handle routing traffic to versions of the application that are still in you know, kind of the, the legacy deployment uh, over to some of the newer components. And this, this is a creative way of having their own DNS mechanism for developers to control the it routing. Is. So great. Um, so digging in a little bit deeper, yes. why don't you explain what you know, what are they, what's the inputs into this process and <laughs> right, ultimately yeah. how did you package them? So we really wanted to offer for the grid applications that are truly legacy and don't need to be refactored for cost effectiveness, um, a lift and shift option. And I really want to stress where appropriate because if you can refactor, please do. Um, so what we ended up doing though, uh, since our grid environment was based off of RPMs, we were able to make a base image that really reflected a mini version of a grid platform in a Docker container. And this was a really, really fun way to use Docker container in a Pivotal platform. Then again, you see that traffic layer that we put in so we can handle our SSL properly. And then there's this other piece called Fluent Bit. And what that's doing for us is allowing us to continue to use our orange logs, which you probably heard Barbara Sanders, Sanders earlier. We really love calling things orange. Uh, but we also have this really cool uh, Home Depot logging um, component called Orange Log, which we wanted to keep the integrity of the logs and their structure intact. And the way we did this with Fluent Bit, 
was uh, saying, OK, FluentBit, I need you to look here at these files and then just port them over to this logger gator. Uh, there's a lot of other logs that are involved, but probably not as, as important. Um, a lot of your standard outs are really easy to handle in this situation. They're standard out. We're still picking them up through the normal Pivotal logs. So this is pretty interesting, and I'm curious if any, um, anybody else has deployed applications as RPMs in the past. I know I've heard of that before. But yeah? You have? What? Okay. Okay. So, it, you know, I, I, and we see this pattern quite a bit in, in legacy apps where getting, getting new updates to applications out to servers, you know, just you know, package them up in RPMs and send them out to a physical server. Yep. Uh, and in this case, the RPMs, they contain the JDK, yes. the Tomcat, and the application bits all together. We right? did have a requirement, though. Uh, so we did tell them you have to be JDK 8 and you have to be Apache Tomcat 7. Uh, and that was for our platform's own security purposes. And we actually look to continue to upgrade those if we can. Uh, so we're still developing a process to how we can communicate with these legacy teams and say, hey, we've got an update to our base image coming. You need to do some preliminary testing and then go and take it to production. And the wizardly shell script part, oh. that was something you developed for, for the folks that need to do the migrations, Absolutely. Right? Again, back to empowering the developers, making their process as seamless for them as we possibly could. Uh, we wrote just a tiny little script that asked them some basic questions about, where is your application today in Grid? Um, can you tell us what that SSL port is that we talked about earlier? And it pre-configured all the little templates for them, their Docker image, and all they had to do was this nice little setup script. It built the Docker image. It created the Pivotal platform uh, manifest. And it was a simple CF push. Wow, you need to sell that script. I don't know. You could probably Can you get afford it? Good, good, I, I don't know. <laughs> Let's see if my manager will expense it. <laughs> Got it. So going a little bit deeper now, let's talk about what, it, what does this thing look like once it's running and the flow of basically you know, what you had to go through. Right. Uh, so honestly, it sounds pretty easy once we actually give it to the teams to go through the process. Of course, getting there took much longer. But um, it really is easy for the developer. They're pulling RPMs from, uh, I think one time we used Pulp, and then uh, we switched over to Spacewalk. We might end up using Artifactory. Look, we're actually still in this process today. We're not done. Um, and then generating that Docker file, again, came from that setup script we talked about just a little bit ago. And a very simple CF push uh, pushes to uh, the Pivotal platform in Docker images is incredibly easy. It doesn't have to be that one giant long string that you may or may not have seen with CF push, dash D, <laughs> Docker file, artifactory location, da -da. just put it in the YAML. Um, and then the less common platform features, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, you know, I can help summarize sure. those. Um, and, and this was through the experimentation, right? Absolutely you know, you know, was. At, at first, there was thoughts around, you know, can we get the jar file or even the modified version of Tomcat mm -hmm. and somehow affect the Java build pack to get these apps deployed to the platform? And if you're not familiar with build packs, that's pretty much the mechanism inside of the platform that takes an artifact and decides what the bill of materials for a container needs to look like. Uh, but that you know, that experiment didn't get get very far. No. So enabling Docker support in the platform, um, you know, it's we still have uh, a lot of folks out there that look at you know the platform, the Cloud Foundry platform, as not compatible with Docker. You know, that's one of the things um, that we've heard. Let me tell them otherwise. Yes, <laughs> it's true. You can run you Docker can. in the platform. So that was a, an important feature for yes. what you leveraged. Uh, and then this uh, less commonly known feature, which, as I understand, the batch applications need to look ah. each other up based on host names. So when these apps come over, and you can talk a little bit about like yes. how batch batch processes work, but leverage search domains so that you didn't Absolutely. have to. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, one component I really didn't touch on because we're actually still in this process very much. Uh, we have segments of our grid platform, uh, J Java Batch being one of them, which really is like a, a run task environment at specific times. It'll look for jobs to see if something is running to keep things um, uh, running synchronously. And this is a little bit tricky for, for us because we're using Docker containers now in a, a Pivotal platform environment. And what we actually decided to do is exploit the container to container communications um, and running multiple instances and having actual instances of an app communicate back to each other to say, I'm running this job. Don't do it. Yeah, so if you've got any legacy apps that have some 
inter-instance coordination that has to go on. This was an interesting way to, mm -hmm. to exploit the container-to-container -container yes. feature along with the search domains. Um, and then I guess from a security perspective, you know, you're, you're rolling out Docker carefully. Very teams, carefully. Right? Uh, so you don't, you don't want to have access to any registry out there in the wild, definitely not in the public internet. No. <laughs> and there's, there's probably lots of registries stood up within Home Depot today, Right, too. there is. So what we decided on is we have a golden registry um, at Home Depot in Artifactory. Uh, it is a read-only registry that our developers can pull this base image where our slightly modified uh, Apache grid uh, will, will come from. Uh, and from there, they can bring in their own RPMs and they, they build their Docker image uh, from the script from earlier. Um, and then they put their image back into, it's a similar structure, um, but same environment, uh, an artifactory where they will then pull from when they deploy to our Pivotal platform. That's awesome. So that registry whitelisting is, is another feature that yes, uh, it was is. exploited. It was a lifesaver. Security mm -hmm. loved that, by yes. the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet security loves the fact that you're getting the feedback from the applications either through the Fluent Bit component out to yep. Kafka uh, or even the standard out uh, capture from the Java process. Right, itself. yeah. We can absolutely go a little bit more in depth there. Uh, so with our logging, you know, we already touched on using Fluent Bit. Uh, and it's actually going out to Kafka. And then mm -hmm. Kafka is then able to say, all right, um, I know that these logs now need to aggregate here. Um, and here might be a, an index in Splunk for us. Yeah, I didn't, and I didn't, never realized that fluent bit be before uh, uh, the Home Depot team showed me this little piece of technology. I wasn't aware that fluent, you know, I've heard of fluent D. You're probably, if you're familiar with Kubernetes by now, who isn't, um, you probably have heard of fluent D. But fluent bit is an even lighter weight version or capability. Are, was that it's written, written in C, written yeah, in so C it, it is fast. <laughs> yeah, and I was reading up on it, it's super low CPU overhead, Very. super low I.O., uh, and it connects up to Kafka Absolutely. to propagate the log files out. Uh, and those, those grid apps, they seem to, they write several log files to disk, right? They do, several log files to disk. Um, so Fluent is able to say, I just need to watch and monitor these files that you're telling me to. How do I handle them? Tell me where to put those. That's Very convenient. easy. In, in addition, we actually wrote a script to monitor the load um, or traffic load that we were getting with uh, traffic and fluent, uh, fluent bit. Sorry. Um, and I was really impressed with just how minimal the impact was. Um, it was a, a no-brainer for us seeing yeah. there was hardly any. And that's another common app migration scenario. Um, one of the things we often have to triage is how are logs written out in older applications if we want to migrate them to the platform. And my understanding is the framework for doing logging for these grid apps is a home-built, homegrown logging Very framework. Very much. And there's also a lot of business value. Uh, in fact, a lot of our logs go to uh, some logger which has a reporting feature that then gives back to business to say, OK, now I can see my reports that have been generated. So maintaining the integrity of those logs was really important. In fact, I would say it was probably the biggest chunk of all outside of the actual application itself. That's awesome. And so in, in summary, the, the apps, um, you did make some code, code changes, but not. You didn't make any code <laughs> changes to the actual apps. Correct. They stick around. But once all these apps are migrated to the platform, yeah. you're able to sunset some infrastructure. Absolutely. And that's the mm -hmm. best win of all. Right. And, and then also, you've upgraded the version of JDK. Yep. And the fact that these are running on container images instead of physical servers, now you're out of the business of patching operating systems for the servers where they. You got it. So you're, you're picking up all the benefits of that shared multi tenant environment where your team is, is patching once for everybody rather than patching individual servers for individual application environments. That's exactly right. That's awesome. That's, uh, I, I bet your, your, your leadership team is going to be <laughs> super happy once all these applications oh, yes. get moved we, over. We are so close, it hurts. <laughs> That's awesome. And then there's some communication with the MySQL database, of course, running outside the platform. Yep. Didn't have to do much there as long as, you have, as, long as there's a network. You just connect to those things. Right. So egress. any messaging access object or a data, a data access object um, is unchanged, really. 
uh, it's still a simple string connection to that thing. Uh, so again, no code changes. Yeah, That's the win. <laughs> and how can you make code changes when all the developers that wrote the code are off doing something else anyway? So it's, <laughs> it was a great, uh, great win by not having to yes. figure out how to make the changes to the code and get it working on the platform. Awesome. So we want to recap the takeaways? takeaways? Sure. Uh, so knowing when the thing or knowing when your thing is going to die, um, <laughs> I uh, may have wordsmithed that incorrectly. Um, but I, I really think the takeaway we got through this whole process is I've begun to learn what to look for when a thing really needs to be revamped or looked at or evaluated. Is it still cost effective? Um, and next action plan. Uh, and I really think truly our developers were the giveaway. Uh, twice now we have seen this, right? Our developers immediately started using other things. And it's like, wait, where are you going? Um, and that was the indication uh, that this tool that was great at one time is starting to die out. Uh, and we had options to reintegrate some features into our grid. We actually tried, but that's when we realized that uh, the cost to integrate new technologies into our grid platform severely outweighed the cost of using Total Cloud Foundry. Yeah, so that's that's interesting. Some, you know, we, we sometimes look at the the easy criteria of you know the vulnerabilities are there. We need to get it patched up, or you know we need to repurpose or or um, get rid of some old infrastructure. But really, in your case, the developers and keeping them happy, they they just didn't want to work on you know some of these older right. technologies anymore. They wanted to work on the newer technologies. Uh, and so once you see that gravitational pull be you know too large, don't fight it. You know, Absolutely. Uh, and, and pick that application as a candidate to be either migrated or, or transformed or whatever it may be. And it makes enterprise sense. Um, you start to look at what other technologies can do. Um, Java may not be the answer for every project you're working on. Maybe it's uh, Go. Maybe it's Ruby. Um, so really being able to have the choice of picking something that is truly representative and, and the tool that makes sense and cost effective for that project um, is a win across the board. So recognizing what your developers are doing and seeing where they're going, um, I think that's number one. Uh, awesome, great tip. Thank you. Now, the automation of the platform, huh? So that, uh, hmm. lots of benefits there from just simply moving the application from its static physical server deployment absolutely uh, into the more common you know swim lane with the rest of the applications right absolutely so now our platform can continue to go through its upgrades um, and we're not touching those applications so we're keeping secure um, or security happy and you know patting us on the back and hopefully that's a win um, <laughs> cool and then the last one um, this is kind of uh, the approach that you know we we try to teach our clients too is um, you know what when they're asking us to help them do the right. the migration you know a lot a lot of times we find that there's fear or, or doubt that you know these legacy applications are gonna be too hard don't touch them you know don't even bother with those applications and and what you learned through this experience through this process is that really just take the app as is start experimenting with it yes push the app to the platform and and fix what breaks you know, that's basically the process here. Um, and you'll probably find that many of your legacy applications are not as difficult or complex as you thought they were. So. And truly, uh, I think even as a systems engineer for Home Depot, uh, my takeaway with the experiment and play was I just didn't realize how versatile our platform, our Pivotal platform really is and all the abilities it has. So I, I really encourage to go experiment, break what you can, uh, and then kind of reverse engineer back. And I think you'll be surprised what you can take away and find out of that. Uh, for us, it was a lot of little tools that I'm now really excited to share with the rest of the community. That's awesome. So, questions, anybody? Anybody uh, have similar scenarios? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how difficult that is, or you know, I guess I'll have to experiment, like you said. But is it just a WAR file deployed with Tomcat? Yeah. 
and uh, does it have a, 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 f a future ahead of it? Does it have a backlog of features that is coming from the business? What, you'll, you can never get rid of it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so the question was, uh, I've got a legacy Spring application that's not based on Spring Boot. You know, what, what's, a, what's an approach to take with that to get started modernizing and taking on these, these benefits? Um, you know, one, the, the pattern that we, we often see is first getting it onto the platform. So if that's a war file deployment, um, you can take advantage of the automation around the platform right away. And what that means for you is then you can go through the process of uh, modernizing the code base so that it's compatible with Spring Boot wrapped in automated testing. Uh, so, so having it automated in the platform will make it a whole lot easier for you to iterate over you know, upgrading the dependencies of the Spring Boot application, testing, break, you know, things breaking, and then responding to those uh, through that iterative, iterative process. Uh, there's, there's definitely patterns for, you know, bringing, carrying um, older versions of Spring Framework forward into Spring Boot, but it does take time, you know, kind of getting through the incompatibilities of the library dependencies. But once you have it automated, you know, using the same, basically the same approach that Ashley's team took here, get it onto the platform, now you can start iterating over it a whole lot easier. I do want to add, um, while you pretty much just heard us re-platforming everything, that's not what's entirely happening. It was more of a 90-10 a rule. We still have 10% of legacy apps that really are difficult and they're not worth it because maybe there's only 15 apps on a different segment that don't really fit this model because of security reasons. Um, and mainly talking about some PCI applications that we have. And we're not a good home for them in this situation, okay? Um, so you have to do a little bit of hybrid of the Reese. Um, there are places where we have to refactor. There are places where we have to rehost. Um, but in our situation, uh, a replatform really fit 90% of the old legacy platform's case. So it might have to be something you consider. Were there any edge cases of apps that we ported over and did not work as we expected? Is that right? Um, not yet. We do actually still have a, a large pool of test developers that are porting over applications today. Um, some of the gotchas that we had were um, we had built our RPM to run Java um, OpenJDK 8. Uh, and we did not know that some of the RPMs coming in were built for Java Sun. Sorry. Um, so that was, that was just a little gotcha. Uh, and we totally anticipate some of those things to pop up. Um, but so far, things have actually been running pretty smoothly. Uh, I would be happy to say, yeah, there was a big gotcha because we're waiting for it. <laughs> we really are. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I don't believe any, not in this environment, no. I don't think so. And I think I saw one more, yes. Uh, no, it, it's. Those applications that you plug in into the grid, they're like small apps, meaning it's not one monolith. You're already broken up, right? So the question is is the grid more like an API gateway? Um, and it sounded like maybe some of these apps were actually a little bit smaller and not monolithic. Um, so I want to go ahead and go back. The grid is absolutely a um, web based server application platform. Uh, so I wouldn't quite say like an API uh, gateway. Um, and y they are pretty monolithic, um, big processes that are probably hundreds of thousands of lines of code. Um, this predates when microservices was even a buzzword. Um, it predates Docker, it predates... Um, um, well, it didn't even leverage Spring, right? It's right, a custom yeah. custom-built framework, uh, homegrown inside. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, Yes, they are very monolithic, they're very large, they're very complicated, they're very intertwined between other applications that I wouldn't even call services, um, making it very difficult, which is why we spent a lot of time on the network layer and how we can keep things going and rolling as we made the transition. Does but, that help? Yeah, 
Yeah. Okay, great. And I'd, I'd just add that session state is another common pattern when migrating legacy applications, especially Java, although we, we run into it sometimes with uh, .NET. Uh, and there are, there are patterns for remediating session state. Uh, it all depends on whether you're leveraging the in-memory heap space of that JVM or if you've got a, a, a caching tier that's plugged in to do that session state. If you've got a tech caching tier, then it's a whole lot easier to migrate those, those applications. Um, and, and then if you don't have a caching tier, we can look at plugging in a caching tier and uh, going through the process of what we call bind. You bind an app that's pushed to the platform to a caching service, and then session is just deferred to that caching grid. Yeah. So if there's a failure, if, if these ephemeral containers you know, die if out of memory or you know, something fails, that session state is maintained in a, a grid cluster external to the app. Yes. Go ahead. So you've got. Go ahead. Yeah. So the question was, um, it's a Tomcat Java-based application. Why did you have to Dockerize it? Why Why couldn't you just use maybe the the standard feature of the platform to, as a right. Java build? Why pack? not use Java build pack? Right. Absolutely. Uh, and that's strictly around a lot of the customization that we had with logging um, and our network and how uh, grid applications today are, are hard set to say, I know that I can communicate to this other grid application um, using this specific URL and SSL port. Um, and without having to make code changes, or if we could make code changes, then yes, we absolutely could have gone that path. Um, but for cost effective, um, it really wasn't in the books to go in and refactor these apps so that they could become that modernized. Mm -hmm. That's not to say for the 10% that we actually have identified that yes, they need to go through this process. They're still being updated. They're still having feature releases. They need to go through this refactor process so that they can use a Java build pack. I guess the other interesting tidbit is it's not Apache Tomcat. It's really Home Depot Tomcat. Correct. Right? Yes. Again, it's, a modified it's, it's version been a modified of, version of yeah. Tomcat. Yeah. Any? Yes. That is correct. So the question is, uh, how did we sell basically rehoming or uh, replatforming lift and shift our apps to leadership? Um, where was the price tag in this? I think that's the kind of yeah. question here, right? Um, and the question is, we've got a, a lot of old proprietary um, systems that are running and quite frankly we can run them more cost effectively in our pivotal platform than we can with our own homegrown system that we've had running for 10, 15 years. Um, so for leadership to see that we could actually take that lift and shift, um, get rid of an additional cost that is running to hold those, that was a win. Um, but honestly the biggest win here is security. We're able to lift and shift these over into a home where they now have more security. The platform is constantly being updated. Um, the, there's a, a wrap to update these apps as they come over to go to Java Open um, uh, 8 and Tomcat 7. Currently, most of them are 7, Java, and uh, Tomcat 6. So I think security had a big say uh, in that process and, and winning leadership over as well. So reducing risk and uh, reducing technical debt. Yes. Right, is the those were the two key business outcomes, I guess. Right. Any more? Great question. Yes. Uh, back to the developer uh, experience or the help for a like, new platform. Sure. So I think to recap, we're asking what was the win for our developers going through this process? Um, and I think we have a couple of different um, types of developers here when we're going 
through this, uh, this migration. We have developers that are pretty committed to maintaining these legacy applications, and then we have developers that are forced to carry a legacy application when they still have new features, right? Um, and so those that have had this opportunity to build on um, and play with new things um, but are still forced to carry along the luggage with them um, are feeling exhausted. Uh, and we wanted to make that process seamless for them so that they weren't feel like they were being dragged along. Um, to remind them that we want to give you the time to keep being innov innovative um, and empowering you. Uh, whereas the developers that probably have been stuck in, in an older phase for quite some time, we want to make the process easy coming into a platform so that when they come home to this new land, um, they get really excited and see just how easy it can be. I hope that, yeah. all right, you're welcome. Any question? Why not make code changes? <laughs> right, so to recap, I would say why not make code changes, right? Yep. Um, does that yeah, yeah. kind of summarize? Um, again, that came down to evaluating whether an application was worth the refactor or not. Um, some of these applications have not been touched in so long. They're truly serving their purposes and their business needs as they are today. Um, and the cost it would take to refactor or build from the ground up even uh, outweighed the cost it would take to move over, I'm going to say, hundreds, maybe even close to thousands of apps to this new, new land. Do they have a limited life or are they going to continue on? That's a great question. Um, probably not an answer for something that I can give you a good answer on personally uh, <laughs> since you know, I don't own any of these apps personally. Um, I would like to say that probably their, their value will change and hopefully I would personally like to see these things re refactored and revisited near the future um, versus just letting us carry it along because as we continue, you have to keep handling it um, and the process could change again. Yes? Boy, I wish my, oh, so, so sorry. The question was, why does Home Depot have its own version of Tomcat? Um, and I wish my principal engineer was here for that, honestly. Um, I was not here when it was built. Uh, the history of the grid, right? Yes. <laughs> it's it's quite, uh, quite old. Um, but if I had to take a guess, uh, probably security. Yeah. And, and also, I, the one thing I remember hearing is uh, cutting out the unnecessary pieces of Tomcat so that's an even smaller smaller footprint, uh, but I'm sure there's more to it, you know, mm -hmm. going back to the history. Right. Um, and, and again, this, the grid started about, about the time that JEE was yep. like, super popular and, you know, um, well, at that point you forked it and not contribute back, right? Because you were a big company, you didn't necessarily give your developers the freedom to contribute back and there's no problem, you forked it. So that's kind of one way to take off there, right? Right. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Is your PaaS backed internal cloud or external cloud? Is our PaaS cloud internally or externally backed? Is that the question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, all internal for this one. Yep. Mm -hmm. We have several environments, but specifically, specifically uh, the situation we're in here, this is all internal. Yeah, Any a lot, of these, a lot yeah. of these. A lot of these applications are brokers back to the mainframe, right? And yes, yeah, so a lot of these are backed, uh, communicating to a mainframe. Um, I may or may not have also written an app on the grid back in the, my days and um, caused an influx of MIPS communications, which I got a phone call later about. <laughs> Lesson learned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So have we started the process of refactoring some of these applications? Absolutely yes. Uh, so we have quite a few developers that are coming to us now saying, okay, I'm actually refactoring, I'm going through this process. Um, and there's a little bit of a learning gap for some of them because they haven't really had the experience of our Pivotal platform yet. Um, so they've got a lot of questions about, well, services in the grid acted a lot different than they do in our Pivotal platform. 
Um, so they'll come with us with questions on, well, how do I make this thing work? Uh, and I'm so glad to see that, yes, we absolutely have refactoring going on. Can you say that one more time? Ah, okay. So, what were some other challenges aside from our logging and the network nuance? Right, that uh, that we've gone through. Absolutely, the networking was, I think, um, one of the longer hauls that we went through, simply because our grid platform required this SSL communication, um, and we knew it was there, and we definitely had lots of communication with y'all over at Pivotal. Mm -hmm. Um, I think some of our early day conversations looked at, um, I'm trying to remember. I remember we were talking about, um, ah, one of the first things was our Docker container. We're like, hey, we can only expose one port. How do we handle this? Um, ended up not being a problem. Uh, so traffic was able to help us through that process. Um, and then. We, we tried, um, inst inst so you landed on multi-instance of the same app. Yep. Um, but originally, the experiment was individual instances of applications that need to be load balanced were pushed individually, right? The same right. app individually. Uh, and so getting that, you know, some of these old apps have some nuances about how they communicate with each other. So that networking aspect takes a little bit of experimentation to find out which pattern in the platform and these are sort of advanced pl patterns. It's not the just simple push an app mm -hmm. and get my URL uh, using container to container, experiment with that, um, experimenting with you know, the indexes of knowing the multiple instances. Um, so, so there was various experiments that you had to go through there that, that they went through to, yep. to, to settle on this solution. But I think so far um, we've touched on most of what we've handled so far. And in fact, we're still going through the process today. We're, we're not completely done, um, and then we're still learning as we go right now, in fact. Any more? Yes? Sure. Uh, what was the time frame, and what kind of involvement did we have from our developers during this process? Uh, so the Leadership kind of came down on us uh, at the beginning of 2019, actually, uh, January of this year, um, to say, hey, we want this done in like two months. <laughs> We're like, um, it's going to take a little longer than that. Uh, so what ended up happening is uh, some of the, the old um, grid owners kind of came to our platform team and said, all right, um, can you help us? Is this the right home? And we had conversations to kind of flush out some high concept ideas. Um, and this was before we even realized we had SSL problems or we had um, uh, some uniqueness to handle Java batch and using the container to container. So long before any of those conversations or were even thoughts that it could be a problem, we're like, yeah, sure, let's give it a go, right? Um, and then as far as like developer um, implementation and what they contributed to to our process, uh, we really we, we were looking for developers that could really help go through the the process that we were hoping would work, um, and getting feedback from them and seeing them actually go through the process and where their pain points were, um, and really truly what we're looking for from the developers is say, dude, you missed this really big piece that is really important and has a big business value, um, but so far we've been. I really don't want to say it. We've been pretty lucky. Um, that I think we've hit most of our major components that were requirements for business value. Um, and really their, their value, the developer's value back to us going through our process has been, um, you're doing the right thing. Um, you're, you're making my experience pretty good. You're lightening my job so I don't have to work nearly as hard to, to port this over. And publishing the recipe prior to asking yes. the rest of the developers to you know, take this you know, process. Absolutely. That's a key ingredient. Yep. You know, have the recipe documented uh, in a place that everybody can you know, consume and everybody applies the same approach to migrating their apps. Yep. And I think the one question that I didn't really answer for you was uh, what was the resources involved? What did that look like? Um, so the team I'm on, oops, I'm so sorry. Uh, the team I'm on is a, a team of seven-ish. 
Um, and I say seven-ish because we still have a platform to take care of, right? So we're not all 100% dedicated to this migration effort. Um, so we, we pair on and off in between this process. Um, and I would say at most it's probably two or three of us um, that are completely heads down and the others, are, they, they know what's going on so they can come in at any time if they need to. Um, and as far as the developers that are helping us with the testing and kind of our beta testers to make sure that this process works for them, um, we've got about 15, I think, for us that are testing out and letting us know you're doing good or you're such an idiot. <laughs> Any more? All right, well, I'm hoping that uh, we're giving you all some time back to yourselves. I want to say thank you so much yes, for coming thank you, here. Everyone. Yeah, enjoy your, your evenings. All right.